，鬼岛之音 ，Ghost Island Media。Hi everyone, I'm here today with Tony Ronaldo, who is an Australian agronomist, but is widely known as the forest maker. Tony lived and worked in Africa for decades, where he discovered and put into practice a solution for the extreme desertification of the Sahel region. People are surprised. They call me that you mentioned the forest maker. Actually, 95% of my work is regreening mindscapes. And if I win that battle, because nature's already provided, is actually, despite the destruction, is very, very resilient, very capable of self-healing. This simple practice, which don't worry, we'll talk about later, might blow your mind. It has restored six million hectares of land, with over 200 million trees in Niger alone. Farmers can now regenerate and protect their lands and ecosystems, helping to improve the livelihoods of millions. I found Tony to be an inspiring individual, humble yet deeply rooted huh, into his own work. We had a great conversation about inspiration, life's purpose, and what it means to make a difference. This is Waste Not Why Not, a sustainability podcast from Ghost Island Media. I'm Nature Nate. A sustainability consultant based in Taiwan, working on energy, ocean, and waste. So today, Tony Ronaldo is here in Taiwan in the studio. Yes, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today.、Um, I grew up in a very beautiful part of Australia. And I always loved trees. However, in that district that I grew up in, the bushland was being bulldozed,、mm. and steep hills were being left fallow for years on end. And with the agriculture, a lot of toxic chemicals,、uh, DDT and other chemicals that were sprayed from aeroplanes, and the drift was going into the rivers, poisoning the water, sometimes killing the fish. Uh, DDT, the famous pollutant from Silent Spring. Yes, they were, that was raining down on you as a kid, or just the forest nearby. Well, it was on the agricultural land, but、uh, the spray drifted into the rivers that we swam、uh, in and fish from.、Oof. And every now and then, there'd be a big fish kill. Great big trout would come floating downstream, <laughs> belly up. So you can imagine having a very big impact on a young boy. At the same time, I was quite curious about the world, and I realised that while Farmers in our district were primarily growing tobacco. There were children born elsewhere who were going to bed hungry. The whole situation just didn't make much sense to me. It was so unjust, and the idea of making short-term gain at the expense of the environment. We need a new road. We need a new mall. Yeah, we need a new parking、yeah. lot. So progress, development was unquestioned. And and yeah, I was certainly upset by the、mm. destruction, but the fact that I was the strange one <laughs> that hurt more, I think, and that probably hurt more than the actual destruction. How could it be strange to just question that? And I think in the end, the redeeming thing was I just said a child's prayer: "Please use me somehow, somewhere to make a difference."、Mm. And for me, that was really the start of how I. Gone on this journey that took me to Africa and now takes me to many countries around the world, trying to get people to work with nature instead of destroying it. Wow! So, you said something really interesting. Growing up, the thing that hurt the most was what、well, was the destruction of nature, but also that people. Treated you differently because you were concerned about this. Well, it was normal to、mm. behave that way. It was normal to, in my view, abuse nature in order to make a living. So you felt you were a strange one. You know, I think many people listening, I can certainly relate to that. You've sort of felt this way. You saw this happen to your hometown: forest degradation, the DDT, and then you went to Niger and you started doing. Deforestation work there. Well, well not deforestation work. Reforestation. So, Reforest. So, preventing deforestation.、Yeah. So I inherited a pre-existing、um, tree planting project, which was a wonderful idea. So we arrived in Niger Republic, which is landlocked, very poor country in West Africa, borderland of the Sahara Desert. We arrived in 1981, and there I was, a young graduate. I'd studied agriculture. To be confronted by a landscape on the point of ecological collapse 
even though it had been a biodiverse dry land forest in my lifetime, by the time I arrived there, it was barely able to support life. The trees had been largely cleared, droughts were becoming more frequent, more severe, and people were suffering. There's a lot of displacement, a lot of hunger. And the uh, project that I inherited had been going for a number of years. In the 1970s, there was a very severe drought and famine, and the organization that I joined had done famine relief, but they realized this would be repeated again and again and again. Right. And so when they had some leftover funding from that relief period, they asked the donor, which was the Canadian government actually, CEDA, they asked them, can we use this leftover money for reforestation? And they started a um, community woodlot, because scarcity of firewood is a big issue, woodlot and windbreak project. Very difficult to grow crops when at planting time you have 70 kilometer per hour winds sandblasting the emerging crop and outright burying it in sand. So the idea oh. was on the edge of the farms, let's plant windbreaks. And it was struggling. People were hungry. They didn't see the value in planting trees. In their minds, that would take several decades to benefit them. They're hungry today. Mm -hmm. And so the, the project was really struggling and that's what I inherited. But I gave it my best. And I studied any text I could get. I consulted the experts. I experimented with different species, different methods of planting. But under those harsh conditions on the edge of the Sahara Desert and with the people's attitude, nothing worked. Certainly not in an economically viable way, not in a sustainable way. And um, one day I was driving, actually, I had a pickup truck full of tree seedlings and a trailer being pulled behind full of tree seedlings. We're heading out to the villages knowing full well 80 or more percent of those trees would die. People didn't care, there's no fencing, the goats would get in eventually and so on. And feeling quite discouraged. When you're young, you're convinced first that you're invincible <laughs> and secondly you're going to solve the world's problems yesterday. And it just wasn't happening. And at a certain point I had to stop the vehicle, it's very sandy soil there. You need to reduce the air pressure so you don't get stuck in the sand. And I'm looking, stop, let the air out, and stood up and looking over that landscape, north, south, east, west, barely a tree in sight. And those questions, how many million dollars, how many <laughs> years were going through my mind? I thought, no, it's impossible. Using these methods, you'll never succeed. And the strange thing is, I'd been traveling on that bush track for about two and a half years, nearly every week, mm. eyes open but totally blind to what had been there the whole time. Mm. And on this particular day, what appeared as a bush in the near distance attracted me. And I took the trouble to walk over and take a closer look. And when I got there and I saw the shape of the leaf, you need to go into your backyard or into the local park and look at any tree, any plant species. As soon as you see the leaf, it's like a signature. It tells mm. you what it is. And as soon as I saw the leaf of what I thought was a bush, I realized it's a tree. It's not a bush, it's a tree. And you bend over, brush away some of the sand, there's a stump under there. And bingo. I wasn't fighting the Sahara Desert. It wasn't a question of a multi-million dollar budget or a miracle species of tree that could withstand goats and drought and even people pulling them up. Mm. Everything that you needed was literally at your feet because there are millions of these tree stumps, these little bushes strewn across that landscape, and millions of seeds that are like time capsules. They're very, mm. very hardy. They're, they have a hard seed coat. They can last for decades until the right conditions come. They're right through that whole landscape. And so from that point, my whole approach changed. It wasn't the perfect tree species, a new way to till, a drone? <laughs> well, all these technological approaches, trying to solve a problem just purely from a technical perspective. It became a social issue. If it was people's uh, false beliefs about the value of trees on their land and negative attitudes, thinking of them as weeds and destructive practices that brought the landscape to its knees, this is where the real battle was, not financial, not mm. technical. It's in between the ears. Mm. And people are surprised. They call me, you mentioned the forest maker. Actually, 95% of my work is regreening mindscapes. Mm. And if I win that battle, because nature's already provided, it's actually, despite the destruction, it's very, very resilient. 
very capable of self-healing if we remove the constraints, right. such as burning and overgrazing and plowing, continuous cutting. If we remove those constraints or at the very least modify them, then nature's got a chance to come back very, very quickly. And so from that point on, I just became a campaigner working with individuals and communities, trying to convince them it's in your best interest. You can have a better future for yourself and your children if you work with nature <laughs> instead mm. of always destroying it. That's fascinating. I, I think looking at nature for the tools within it is so interesting. I'm from California. A lot of ecosystems there are designed to deal with burning and just there in the desert, a lot of these plants, it sounds like, are used to maybe recovering after a heavy sandstorm or some kind of disruption that occurs. And you're able to look down in that moment of peace, maybe, and, and see that solution. But how did you convince people to try it? Well, it was quite a battle. And I forgot to say, they actually called me the crazy white farmer in those early days. Because who in their right mind? You're already hungry. You're going to devote valuable farm space to a tree. And you won't get a benefit in their minds. You won't get a benefit for a decade or several decades. That's your former title. We're not going to use that. No, no, no. That's, that's past. I'm the king of farmers today. <laughs> um, but today, in hindsight, I would argue that the bigger culprit in deforestation was not climate change, was not desertification or even goats. Goats usually get a bad rap. The biggest culprit was well-meaning policies. The policies were set to protect the trees, but they were perverse in that they had the opposite effect. Hmm. And in people's minds, if it's not my tree on my own land and it's not yours, I better take it today before you do because we're all needy. Ah, uh, like a then, tragedy, the common situation. Very much. Nobody owned those trees and, hmm. and people did need to grow food. They just, over time, they cut them down. When we arrived there, there was barely a tree. The average tree density on farmland was about four trees per hectare. It, it had dropped from 80 at the turn of the century down to four. Wow. And that was just average. Many farms had no trees. So how did we convince them? I thought, you need to go carefully here. Are they already against the idea? But in every community, there's a, what's called a positive deviant, people who don't think the same way as everyone else. And so I asked for volunteers in about 10 villages. Is there anybody who would be interested in doing an experiment with me? And as soon as you approach it that way, you're putting them in the driver's seat. Mm. They're co-researchers in this experiment and not being mm. dictated to, not being forced to do something that they might not like to do. And I said, look, I think this would work. Would you be willing to try it? So it's this sharing of responsibility, acknowledging their skill, their knowledge, their wisdom to be co-researchers, co-developers of mm. this method. I think that's what brought them in. But still, one person in each of 10 villages is not a majority by a long shot. Right. And traditions die hard. Those trees started to disappear. <laughs> and, oh. and the 10 farmers were very discouraged. You can imagine, this is 1983. It looked like it was working. The trees were growing beautifully. People were cutting them out. Wow. Victims of their own success. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And so 1984, we had the opportunity after lots of ups and downs to create a food for work program in a hundred villages. And the idea was if you want food, if you need the food, we require one of the work requirements is to regenerate 40 trees per hectare. And each month we'll count them and we'll give a food allotment at the end of the month for your family. Mm. I think begrudgingly, <laughs> the majority of people did that, but they still thought I was crazy. <laughs> They still thought that those trees, as they grew, they would shade their crops, they would compete. Right. And so they did it very reluctantly. And that went on for six or seven months while the food aid was needed. As soon as we stopped the food aid, 70% of half a million trees got cut out. Oh. Finished with Tony, we'll get on with our life. Wow. But the interesting thing is about 30%, 25-30% said, well, <laughs> yeah, the guy is a bit nuts. But it didn't do any harm. And look, we actually got a bumper crop this year. And did you notice some of those wild fruit trees that we used to enjoy when we were kids, they're starting to regrow. And some of those trees provide fodder, fuel wood, and the soil underneath the tree was darker, it was more moist. I think I'll take this another year and see where it takes us. 
Mm. That was the start of a movement that was unstoppable. And over the following 20 years, it spread at the rate of a quarter of a million hectares per year. 200 million trees across 5 million hectares of farmland without planting a single one of them. Wow. And most of that, without my knowledge, it just spread from farmer to farmer. Wow. So it was really interested in how the farmers picked it up. You know, I think that approach is clearly the way to go, but, you know, that doesn't always happen. People don't always listen to local communities. So it sounds like it spread spontaneously. You went after these positive deviants, people in the community who were willing to take risks, worked with them. And then once you've had, you know, then there was some maybe a bit of luck maybe with the rains. And then that translated into something that carried on and stayed. How did your funders receive this work? How did, because there was this consensus on we do tree planting, we do it this way, there's farming by the book. How was this received sort of internationally or sort of with funders and donors? At that time, our main donor was CEDA, Canadian International Development Agency, which is now DFAT. They've changed their name, but um, they are one of the best donors I've ever dealt with. They're so flexible. We would write to them and say, (laughs) conditions have changed. Can we do famine relief this year? Or this village, it wasn't in the original budget, but they actually don't have any water. It doesn't make much sense to talk about trees when people are thirsty. Can we tweak the budget to accommodate that? And they always said yes. In the case of FMNR, it was a requirement that we report, I think, quarterly. And I explained everything in in each report, how the tree planting had failed, the struggles that we'd had, the different methods and, you know, the research that we put into it to make it work. And then I described the discovery and I would list all the benefits and how the people were embracing it. You've got to be flexible. And it makes sense if you're always monitoring and getting feedback from the community and from the work that you're doing, by default, you should be able to adjust in response to that. Let's get a little technical and talk about what FMNR is exactly. Sure. We've talked about, you know, seeing a little sprout coming out of a stump. What is it exactly? Sure. So I actually like to talk in terms of three levels. And the one that people are most familiar with is the technical level. Mm. And so it's the selection and management of uh, trees and sometimes bushes growing in a landscape from cut down trees, so from tree stumps. Sometimes even bits of root have the ability to re-sprout. And what it involves is, it depends on the the landscape and the purpose of the farmer. If it's agricultural land, they will want a species that are synergistic, complementary to their crops or their livestock. They won't want a tree that's heavy shading and suppressing the crop. And so what FMNR looks like on agricultural land might be very, very different if your objective is to restore a biodiverse natural forest where Mm. you'll allow everything to come up that's indigenous. Uh, What it involves, so you select the trees that you want. In the case of tree stumps, when you cut a tree, there will be a profusion of stems. In some cases, 30, 50 or more stems coming up from one stump. Now, there's enormous competition there for the same light, even space, moisture and nutrients. So it's like a mini forest within the tree itself. Yes, yes. And if you did nothing, eventually it could become a tree. One lead will dominate and suppress the others, but it'll take an awful long time. The management part comes in where you say, okay, let's select the very best, strongest, most robust stems and cull out the excess and we'll leave up to five stems. Hmm. Why five? Well, people in developing countries generally don't have gas or electricity, this is their fuel source. And if we only leave one (laughs) and need comes along, then they'll cut that one. You'll be back to zero again. If we leave five, we can have a rotation and encourage them to cut one every year, allowing the others to regrow, to continue growing. And where you've cut one, allow a replacement sucker to take over. In time, by the fifth year, that fifth one will be very tall. And if farmers are open to it, we can then say, oh, this is working really well. Would you consider just removing perhaps a third of the branches if you need wood? Don't cut the whole tree down at the base because you've got to fight the goats and the drought and the plows and all that again. But once it's a tree, remove maybe up to a third of the branches per year and allow them to recover so that you never denude that landscape completely. Mm. So it's selection and management of the growth and then dealing with constraints. 
the main ones that we see, abuse of fire. So fire is a useful tool if you use it the right way. But generally, whole landscapes are burnt every year across vast swathes of of land, and that's destructive to the seeds that are germinating or, or the mm. shoots that you're managing. Uh, livestock, continuous, complete overgrazing, again, suppresses tree regrowth. Can we manage our livestock differently so that while these bushes are young and vulnerable, they're protected from that excessive damage? Plowing. Do we really have to plow every square inch of land so that there's nothing else there apart from your crop? And then the difficult one, I would say, is removal of woody biomass because people have to eat mm. and people have to cook that food if it's going to be nutritious. Mm. Uh, what do you do in the interim when there's no fuel wood out there? And that is a difficult one. Often we get around it a little bit by saying, well, let's not do the whole landscape at once. We'll reserve an area uh, by actually even in the first year from the pruning, you'll get some benefit. But each year after that, as the trees grow, there'll be more and more prunings to take away and use for firewood. As that plot's established, then we'll treat a second plot and so on and so on. Yeah. I just, I like the technical aspect. I just, you know, wanted that for the tree nerds, you know, for the, some gardeners to listen and, and get some ideas. Well, I, I love it too. And um, the founder of permaculture, Bill Mollison. I was going to ask if it sounded like permaculture, well, you know, uh, tilling and well, yeah. w working with nature instead of hitting it on the head all the time. <laughs> but Bill Mollison said the solutions to the increasingly complex problems of the world are embarrassingly simple. <laughs> FMNR is embarrassingly simple. So that's the technical side, and it's wonderful because it's low cost, it's rapid, it's scalable. But before you even get to that, you know, what's the motivation for doing it? Mindset change comes into it. Turning, right. and I got this expression from a Tanzanian farmer, turning enemies of trees into friends of trees. Mm. What future do you want for yourself and your children? If you work with nature, if you allow some of these trees to regrow, you can create the future that you want for yourself and your children. And once farmers make that realization and switch in their mind to care for the trees, manage them sustainably, of course have your crops, of course have your livestock, but don't delete the trees from the landscape. Once you have that mindset change, then that's fertile ground for doing the FMNR, the technical side. Mm. Now, if you convince a whole community or a whole district to change their mindset, what you have in FMNR is a landscape restoration tool, landscape level restoration mm. tool. That's, that's incredible. And I, I think what I think of immediately is we've been talking about desert landscapes. We've been talking about areas that are facing really, really intense challenges fuel, wood, uh, famine scenarios. How can FMNR work in other areas? Is this something that someone listening to this podcast, maybe they live in Taipei and it's sort of a subtropical jungle. Maybe they live in, in Canada. Is this something that you can do everywhere or is it best for deserts? The, the principles apply across a surprisingly wide range of landscapes. And mm -hmm. I, I've done this on the foothills of the Himalayas, in the humid tropics, on the coast, in fact, this year we're starting a project in the sea wow. with, with mangroves in, wow. the, in the Solomon Islands. We've done it in arid and hyper-arid areas. We've done it in alpine areas. The principles work across all of those environments. Mm. Even, I would argue, it's not necessarily about trees. I would argue you could restore prairies. If mindsets change the way you treat the environment, you can restore that landscape to an approximation of what it was pre-colonization. Mm. So that those principles still apply. Um, it tends to be taken up more actively in the harsher, drier areas because I think people have fewer options. Mm. So you don't always have the option of planting a high-value mango tree or a teak species. And um, you, often you don't have irrigation, so you can't have high value crops that you might grow on that land. I see. This is cheap, this is fast, and it has quick returns. Often people in those settings, they really embrace this. And part of the reason why it's spread, even without my knowledge, in the Sahel is because of those direct early benefits. Now, it still works in the humid tropics. I still encourage farmers and communities to do it, mm. but they might be more 
more liable to put in the high value crops and get a higher return on the investment. I would still argue at the very least that rocky outcrop, that mountainside that you're not cultivating, it's beneficial to you, even in economic terms, it's beneficial mm. to you to have the trees on that hill. You'll get pollination services, pest predation services, reduced erosion and flooding, and in some cases, reduced mudslides, reduced impact of drought because water tables are going to be recharged. Right. Higher humidity, uh, lower wind speeds, lower temperatures. There are economic as well as environmental reasons for doing it in any landscape. Wow. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. I'm sold. Happy to become an advocate. Wonderful. We'll, uh, we'll sign you up today. <laughs> yeah. So I want to talk about sort of the future and, and where you see this kind of scaling up at the landscape level, because I think people have a lot of anxiety about deforestation. But before I go to that, I do just want to ask sort of, how did you know, or did you even know you wanted to do this for so long? According to your LinkedIn, according to your bio, you know, you've, you've been working with World Vision for several decades now. That's, do you ever go, maybe not trees, maybe I want to get into cars, or how did you know this is the path you wanted to walk down? Oh, no, hardwired, hardwired, always loved trees, always impacted me very deeply when I saw deforestation and those bare hills in the beautiful valley that we grew up in. I always had an awareness of global issues. So while deforestation was happening in my own backyard, I'd read about the Amazon forest and the forest in Borneo. Mm. I'd read about droughts and degraded landscapes in the Sahel. So I can't, <laughs> I'm not wired that way. I can't imagine me ever getting into high tech or cars or something. <laughs> Just This was the only choice. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'm like a pig in the mud. It's just so good to be doing what you love doing. <laughs> okay. That's, that's amazing. Um, yeah. People just always ask, how did you know you wanted to pursue that? How did you know trees? And I guess you just always know. Yeah. And, and little things that happen along the way. So at that time when I was so angry, my dad had a machinery business and he had many farmer friends. And one day he was visiting one of these friends and it was the off season. His tobacco shed was cleared. And this guy was a little bit of a wheeler dealer. So he'd gone to a library clearing sale and he bought back whole trailer load of library books. <laughs> and he just dumped them unceremoniously in the middle of this shed. <laughs> and we're in there, Dad is talking to his mate, and I'm walking around this pile looking at the books. And two books had no pictures on the cover, just dull green. Why they leapt out at me, I don't know. Why they caught my attention, I don't know. But I picked them up, and they were by the same author, Richard St. Barbie Baker. Look him up later, Richard okay. St. Barbie Baker. Self-appointed global forester, protector of the trees, Advocate for Sustainable Forestry. The first book was called um, I Planted Trees. <laughs> <laughs> the second one, Sahara Conquest. And oh. yeah, I think it was 1952 or 1954, he did a trans-Sahara trek and just described the ancient ruins and that landscape that used to have trees as he went through the Sahara, through the Sahel, and then all the way across to Kenya. It just gripped me. I thought, oh, not all adults are out there destroying things. There's some of them that are doing the kind of thing that I think I'd like to do. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Yeah. I, I will have to look him up. Oh, do. He's fascinating. He's yeah. fasc tree planting long before it was, was cool, I guess. In the U.S., you have Johnny Appleseed. but He would have been one of the early environmentalists talking to heads of state, to institutions, companies, ordinary people about the need for trees. And he's very poetic in parts. He talks about when the trees go, the water goes. When the water goes, the birds and the mm. insects go. The soil loses its fertility and it just goes down and down and down. The final line is, and the age-old phantoms, pestilence, disease, famine return to stalk the land. Mm. And that kind of poetry really, really gripped me because it was what I was seeing, you know, the hunger and the Sahel and so on. He was describing it before it actually happened. Wow. An unfortunate prophet. So back then, there weren't many people advocating for the trees. Maybe there was a few. It feels like today in 2022, almost 2023, there are 
many people talking about trees, climate change. I've never seen such awareness about the climate crisis, about deforestation. There's a lot of people proposing million tree programs. There's things like direct carbon removal from the air. There's tree, all sorts of tree offsets and things. You've been in the tree world a long time. Where do we stand now? Where are we, where do you think we're going? What's the state of, you know, the climate crisis as it relates to desertification? And are you seeing any signs of hope? Sure. So first of all, if you're familiar with Monopoly, there's no get out of jail free card. <laughs> and what I mean by that is we have to turn away from fossil fuels as quickly mm. as possible. That's a given. I don't use tree planting as an excuse to continue my wasteful, polluting, destructive lifestyle. That right. has to change. And there are multiple reasons why we should be doing this. Yes, fight climate change. And there's various studies. If we restored 1 billion hectares of degraded forest, we could draw down anything between 15% and 25% of existing greenhouse gases. Wow. Why, why not do it? We send people to the moon. <laughs> we waste money on fighting each other with and destroying cities. We have the money, we just lack the will mm. to do this enormous good for society and the environment. It's possible, we just lack the will. Social reasons, people's health and well-being. Agriculturally, we can increase food production, crop production. In Niger, the net result of that 5 million hectare restoration, every year without subsidies, fertilizer, irrigation, coercion, Every year, because farmers are now working with nature instead of destroying it, they're growing an additional 500,000 tons of grain. Wow. Now, if you have access to resources, you can increase that. But these are the poorest farmers in the world that can now make a dignified living because mm. they're working with nature. So there's no real downsides. What I would urge, these wonderful initiatives, well-meaning initiatives to plant a million, a billion, even a trillion trees. By all means, but please first consider what's already there. In most cases, it's not even questioned. People don't even think nature is capable of helping itself with a little bit of help. And it was the same in my case. When I arrived in the Sahel, it was an automatic response. There appears to be no trees here. I have to plant trees. Mm. I would argue that in probably 80, 90% of the cases globally, that's not true. So instead, you'd argue, go listen, see what's there. Maybe there's roots, maybe there's seeds, maybe there's things we can build off of. Definitely. Right. You've been on a global book tour, documentary tour, seeing the sites, going to different countries. Taiwan is, is your last stop? For this year. <laughs> I hope it's not my last <laughs> Your last stop for this year, before the, the holiday season. Yeah. How have, how have other countries, how have different cultures received your ideas? Oh, there's this growing momentum. Uh, very, very warmly they embrace it. I think the world is desperate for hope, hopeful stories. The world is desperate for solutions that actually work. Mm. And what's undeniable, that the satellite images are there, the ground proofing's there in the case of Niger and, and more and more other countries. People love the story and it's been... Um, been overwhelming, really, the response. After years of struggle and uh, often not feeling that I was being heard, it's wonderful now to have an audience. <laughs> <laughs> Just took a few decades. and <laughs> <laughs> Took a lot of perseverance. Um, but yeah, it speaks to the value of continuing despite all the knockbacks. If you really believe in what you're doing, if you've evaluated the evidence, is it true what you're saying or is it all hype? Mm. then no matter what the pushback and the criticism, stick with it. Believe in yourself, believe in what you're doing. And certainly in my case, that's paid off. Well, um, those are all my questions. Anything, anything else you want to share? Any ideas you want to convey to our audience? Certainly, I might, I might add to that idea. I think I mentioned hope a few times. Yeah. And as I have traveled around the world and spoken to a lot of audiences, very often with younger people, and I assume many of your listeners are younger. It's sad that I see so many younger people, they're despairing of the The future. climate anxiety is, is massive. I get asked about that quite a lot. Yes, yes. And they feel it's too late. 
that uh, there's nothing they can do about it. I would argue very, very strongly that's not the case. There's always something that you can do about it Mm. it, within your capacity. Maybe you won't go to the Sahel and live there for 17 years the way that I did, but in your situation, there's always something that you can do. Even if it's as simple as turning the light switch off before you leave the room, you can do that at least, but everyone's capable of doing far more than that. And I read a lovely um, quote from John Maxwell, American author and speaker. And he said, hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. Mm. Anger at the way things are. And we all have the right to be angry at loss of biodiversity, loss of forests, what we've done to the climate. We definitely should be angry. If we're not, there's something wrong. The other's daughter's name is courage courage to get up and do something about it and change it. And I realized, actually, hope doesn't fall out of the sky like magic. You make hope happen. Mm. So if you're despairing, if you think it's too late, get up and do something and hope will start to come to you. And in my case, you take that first step and it's amazing. Other people rally behind you and help you. People give resources. People give their time. People open doors for you. And now what started off with you know, one guy pruning a few bushes in the desert, it's becoming very quickly a global movement. Mm. And the organization that I work with, World Vision, is uh, about to launch a campaign to restore 1 billion hectares of degraded land worldwide. We wow. won't do it alone. We invite everyone to participate. Do it on your own. Do it with us. Just do it. So somebody had to hold that knife and prune that first bush. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, it sounds like Hope might have two daughters, but she's also a tree. If you're in a desert and there's no hope, start with something small, a seed, a root, a tree stump. And then before you know it, it's a tree and that hope creates space for other people. For sure. For sure. <laughs> wow. Thanks so much, Tony, for taking the time to talk with us. Wish you the best of luck in reversing a billion hectares of desertification will amplify that message and include uh, these other authors and resources you mentioned in the show notes. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Tony Ronaldo, for taking the time to speak with us about your passion. This is a Ghost Island media production recorded here today in Taipei, Taiwan. Emily Y. Wu is our producer. Jerry Williams is our production assistant. Theme tune by Dak Chang. Show logo by Southwick Graphics. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.